that aside, and we'll bring that back another time. You've you've hooked us up with another brilliant show, and please introduce our guest and, and let's let's bring her on uh, right away. And thanks again in advance. Yes, you're very welcome, and it's my pleasure. Um, and I want to shout out brother uh, Dr. Keto Swan for this connection and introduction. But we have with us today Dr. Yvonne Sion. I'm going to read her bio from the History Makers website. Born in Washington D.C. In 19-something-something, something, Dr. Yvonne Sion graduated as salutatorian of her class at Paul Lawrence Dunbar High School in Washington, D.C. I want to stop right there. Right. And we'll go piece by piece through this piece because, you know, I mix what I like. We like to talk to our elders, <laughs> as African people are prone <laughs> right, to do. Right. right. Like elders have a lot to share with us, so we want to get that wisdom from them. So, Dr. Sion, uh, welcome to the show. Welcome. Good morning. And, Dr. Sion, the first thing that we want to do is talk to you about Dunbar High School. Yes, uh, Dunbar has been in the news recently. Yes. For a number of reasons. Uh, they are. They have just moved into a new building, uh, and uh, uh, it's a beautiful facility. Uh, they're still working on uh, developing the student body so that it will be uh, like the old Dunbar, quote unquote, again. But I was in one of the one of the last classes uh, to achieve the um, or to have the benefit of the school uh, in in its heyday. Okay. Uh, now, now, from what I know of Dunbar, Dunbar is like the uh, the high school that produces the most black doctors um, historically. It has produced the most black prominent people. Uh, uh, Senator uh, Brooke, who just passed a couple of days ago, uh, the first African American senator for many years of post Reconstruction, um, he just passed a few uh, and had his, and was memorialized on the tenth of this month, which was uh, just a couple of days ago. Uh, and he was a Dunbar graduate. But in addition to that, we do have there were many doctor people with doctorates and people who, because they didn't have opportunities in this country went overseas and did marvelous things as well. Um, and what was that like? I'm, I'm assuming Dunbar was an all-black high school. What was that like uh, when you were there? Yes, it was an all-black high school. We were uh, disciplined by our, our teachers. We uh, we had some of the strongest um, professors because at that time, as you know, since African Americans couldn't j get jobs elsewhere, they came back and taught uh, very often. So we had PhDs as, uh, teaching us math and history and sciences, biology, uh, and uh, uh, we thrived in that. We they they insisted on excellence, and we thrived. And you were a salutatorian of your class, which the, is the interesting thing is I was not just salute I was salutatorian, but there were five valedictorians that year. Okay. So it was a strong class. And when you were graduating from high school, what did you imagine that your career would be? Because as we start to get into your career, I want to see how this unfolds from that all-black high school where you were steeped in blackness and excellence. Right, and because we're still dealing with the introduction. We're still doing the introduction here, piece Absolutely. by piece, right? Right, yeah. so as this rolls out slowly, right, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, when I was growing up, the one thing that I knew was that I was going to go to college, uh, that was the only thing that I knew for sure at that point. Uh, didn't ha I, I think I had a sense that I wanted to be a lawyer, uh, and so I went into uh, college uh, anticipating that I'd be a pre-law student. Uh, I never did go to law school. Okay, so then we have that you went to Allegheny College and graduated with honors in 1959. That's correct. And then attended the American University as a Woodrow Wilson Fellow and in 1960 earned your M.A. in political science. Yes, that's correct. Okay, so now we're getting to the part here. So <laughs> you get a master's in political science, and what were you hoping to do with that? Because that starts to take you into the world of Africa. Mm. Well, one of the things about, growing, about uh, attending a, a pretty much all-white uh, uh, college uh, uh, there were some blacks there, and uh, some of them were from Washington, D.C., as a matter of fact. A couple of my classmates were, were had been in high school at the same time that I was in D.C. Um, but one of, those, one of the things about that was that I realized at the first uh, career day that I attended that there was 
nothing that the school was going to be able to do for me in terms of my career. Uh, but that meant that I just did not know what I was going to be doing. I knew that I was interested in Africa and had this vision that I wanted one day to go to Africa. Uh, but I didn't really have any idea that it would happen like it did. I had gotten Af- uh, I had gotten swept up in the winds of change, you might say. Uh, that was the period in which uh, many African nations were moving toward independence. Ghana was the first of those nations to get its independence in '59, and uh, my family. Uh, this goes my activism goes back a long way, but my family uh, was there, and my mother was very active in. Uh, befriending the new African uh, um, uh, diplomatic personnel, and uh, um, she uh, and and in that process we became members of the, there were various friends of groups, friends of Ghana, friends of Nigeria when Nigeria became independent, and uh, we became active in in uh, reaching out to those people, and and there was a, a an institution at that time called Africa House. Uh, on 16th and U Streets, uh, there was a house that uh, Africans lived in. It had been it was being sponsored by the African American Institute, which at that time was uh, being headed by uh, or on the board of trustees. And one of the founders was Leo Hansberry, uh, a black historian. Some of you may know of him. Uh, very well known. He was one of the first Africanists in America. Uh, and certainly the first one in an African American uh, institution. Uh, so he started an African studies program and, he, and pretty much started um, doing the research for African history uh, in that period. In, in the uh, oh, he had been doing it since about the twenties and thirties. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, anyway, Africa, uh, Africa House was something that he uh, envisioned and dreamed of and started. And uh, they would always have programs about Africa, and I attended many of those programs. You're listening there to the voice of Dr. Yvonne Sion. This is our Mix What I Like here at WPFW 89.3 FM. I'm Jared Ball. Dr. Hate's in the building. Mike Nacelle is on the boards. At I Mix What I Like for all your relevant social media and more. We're slowly building through, and you can already see, building through this uh, uh, brilliant elder's biography. And, and uh, uh, you're starting to see, if you don't already know, uh, the breadth of her work and, and experience. Uh, and for those who are aware of this program, you hear usually, as you did this morning, hear Dr. John Henry Clark's voice and part of our uh, normal introduction. And, uh, of course, he was a disciple, as he often acknowledged, of Professor Leo Hansberry, William Leo Hansberry. And once upon a time, a few years ago, in our, one of our discussions about Clark and Hansberry, uh, Hansberry's daughter, who was a resident uh, or was at the time in, uh, uh, here in D.C., called our show. And uh, unfortunately, we were never able to to, to build uh, th- that uh, connection. So obviously, if she's listening, we invite her to connect with us again. Uh, but yeah, anyway, so so it's good to see these these sort of circles uh, uh, reconnecting and expanding and, and, and encapsulating all of us in some sort of way, you know. So, Dr. Sian, I'm, you've left a lot out there initially that I want to go back to. Um, so. How were you connected with the Africa House, and were you at all a student of uh, Leo Hansberry, who was, of course, um, at Howard University and attempting to build the uh, program in African studies at Howard University that we now see under the auspices of the uh, the New Jack Scholar crew with Dr. Greg Carr, Dr. Mario Beatty, uh, Dr. Valethea Watkins Beatty, uh, Dr. Josh Myers and Dr. Woods. So, I mean, the, the the legacy of Hansberry exists at Howard now, in in many ways uh, through this new generation of scholars. How were you connected to Hansberry and the Africa House and African American Institute? Uh, I had met Dr. Hansberry through some of those receptions and activities that I attended with my mother during that period, uh, just after uh, graduating from. Uh, mostly graduating from uh, Allegheny and during the time when I was a student at the American University. Um, he was responsible for my getting my first job um, at the Africa, which was Af- wow. at the Africa House, uh, while I was waiting for the job I haven't mentioned yet, uh, the one in Africa. Um, I had been invited to go to Africa, but by that time, um, 
but had not uh, been able to go because of the unrest there, because of all that was going on there. And uh, uh, Dr. Hansberry uh, helped me get the job at, uh, suggested that I apply to Africa House. When I came back from Africa, Dr. Hansberry offered me an opportunity to be um, a uh, research assistant to him. Unfortunately, I never took advantage of that opportunity because it was a volunteer job, and I I was in need of employment. Mm. Uh, so, capitalism I, I, strikes again. Yes, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> if I had known then what I know now, <laughs> uh, I may, if my whole life might have turned out differently. Mm. But uh, the job that I was waiting for, uh, I had gone to a reception in, uh, and this uh, was not about Dr. Hans- Hansberry, but. Uh, since I was interested in Africa and so forth, all my friends would let me know what was going on, and um, and my mother as well. My mother had been invited to go to a reception for uh, Patrice Lumumba when he came to the States uh, in June, uh, around June, the end of June of uh, 1960, just after they had gotten their independence. And she had missed the uh, event, had forgotten about the event, and, and I was uh, called on to uh, go in her place uh, by a friend of hers. They were supposed to have gone together, and a family friend. And um, so we ended up going to the reception, and that that's where it all began. I met. I didn't. I did not meet uh, Professor Lumumba that night. I met him. I met some of the people in his entourage, and and was uh, given the opportunity. We started talking about the Congo, and somebody said, "Well, you know." Mr. Lumumba, he had left the party by that time, but uh, you can meet him tomorrow at uh, the Blair House, and you know he's looking for people to work in the Congo, and that's how it all began. Wow. Again, that's Dr. Yvonne Seon here at I Mix What I Like, WPFW 89.3 FM. I'm Jared Ball. Dr. Hates in the building. Mike Nacella is on the boards. At I Mix What I Like for all your relevant social media. I mix what I like at gmail.com if you want to respond to the show or even if you want to email us now a comment or a question. We'll happily work it in for you uh, if you want to uh, uh, you know, join the conversation. Uh, we'll take a quick, let's take a quick break. Come right back with more of our, of our special guest here at I Mix What I Like, here at I Mix What I Like, WPFW 89.3 FM. A few weeks ago, I had the pleasure of interviewing uh, uh, Dr. Rico Chapman and Shaheen Arafdeen, who uh, uh, is kind enough to hook us up on our introduction here. Uh, and I mix what I like about their work on hip hop and black consciousness in South Africa. And Dr. Rico Chapman put me on to uh, um, someone he knows very well. I'll say it that way. A brand new artist, uh, Tawana Shantae. We're going to rock a little bit of her work here, Freedom Agent, and then come back with Dr. Sion and more of our conversation uh, with this, this brilliant elder and uh, hear more of her incredible experience. So don't go anywhere. Much more coming up here at I Mix What I Like. You know. Anyway, please, let's get back to the conversation. So we're talking with Dr. Yvonne Sion, a D.C. native, graduate of Dunbar High School, and we are now at the point going through your history and your biography and when you get to the continent and begin the work on uh, the Inga Dam project. So you were invited to the Congo because Patrice Lumumba, who was uh, newly elected as prime minister um, before the tumult in the Congo, you were invited in and then you were brought on for the Inga Dam project. Tell us what that project was uh, well, I, I do want to make one statement before that. There was a lot between when I got to the Congo and when I met Mr. Lumumba at um, uh, where was it at, at uh, the Blair House uh, the day after his the reception for him. He had gone back to the Congo um, and immediately become embroiled in all that controversy and whatnot. Uh, I was very frightened for him uh, by the events and by the role the U.S. was taking in those events. But at some point, um, uh, the president of the Congo, Kasavubu, came to the U.N. to talk uh, because of the secession of Katanga. And, uh, I, and he sent an emissary to my home. Uh, that happened to be Roberto Holden, uh, who tell to tell me that uh, he and Lumumba disagreed on many things, but they were in agreement on my employment, and that as soon as the situation calmed down, uh, he, I would hear from them again. Um, Lumumba was killed on February the, uh, well, actually, I think January 16 
of uh, of sixty one, and it was uh, uh, March when I when I did hear from the Congolese government saying that my employment had been confirmed and I'd be working at the Inga Dam project, and this was a telegram from the High Commissioner for the Inga Dam project, and I was they had reserved a plane ticket in my name already, so. <laughs> So then I was, at that was the point at which I said, well, I, uh, Lumumba made a commitment to me and I to, to the Congo, uh, on that, at the, in that conversation at the Blair House. And so despite all of the turmoil and what was going on there, uh, I decided that I had to keep my part of the prop of the bargain and I went to the High Commission for the Inga Dam Project. What was that like? Uh, I had no idea. I was a liberal arts major, and I had no idea that I'd be doing something in such a technical field. Uh, but my experience with the Inga Dam Project was fascinating and exciting, and it was a, a beautiful, beautiful vision. Uh, at the time, there, there was nothing at Inga. Uh, Inga was a small area outside of, a, uh, of the last port on the Congo River in Matadi. Um and uh, it was uh, it was a one. It's a dam that was going to uh, possibly illuminate all of Africa. It had that potential, mm-hmm. and just learning about uh, the reason for the dam, uh, the studies that had been done, uh, the plan for the three uh, three phase dam that could electif- electrify potentially all of Africa and part of Europe uh, was absolutely uh, um, it was it was mind blowing to me and, and fascinating and uh, so did you have a sense of um, who was funding the dam because you know there's a really good documentary that shows how the US tried to undermine Kwame Nkrumah's regime through the Volta Dam project and You know, you would hear about funders initially investing and then divesting and that being used to create a disruption in the attitudes of the Ghanaians towards um, Nkrumah. And so I'm imagining this is the same kind of phenomenon that you're seeing, this this whole development industrial complex that we understand now through the Inga Dam really being looked at as a project for financial gain for the, the developers and the construction sites and, of course, all the people that are working in hydrology to build the dam. Um, But then also, obviously, the energy field itself is then saying we can make a whole lot of money um, and force the Congo to go into debt off this project. I think you're right, and as I look at what followed my stay in Africa, uh, I can certainly see that uh, it took years and years to get the funding I know that we were very blessed in that the High Commissioner for Inga was a young man who was uh, not only astute and and um, uh, intelligent, but he was um, well, he was he had he educated himself on the dam on on the hydrology on the technical portions of, of what the dam, of what building that dam would be about how it would happen. Uh, he went uh, initially to Belgium to pick up the folders that, of the work that had already been done, the studies that had already been done about the site, about the river flow, uh, and, and about the um, uh, amount of energy that would be created. And so he had he had the foundation. And his his um, first uh, idea was to go to the World Bank, and that was the plan. That was the stage we were in when I left Africa. But when I got to Africa. Uh, the studies had been done, but the site was um, part of a rolling countryside. There were people living there. They were going to have to be evacuated so that the dam could be built. built. Um, and uh, uh, we were going to have to find the money to do all the things that had to be done. Uh, when I say we, the, the high commissioner was going to have to find that money. Uh, again, the World Bank was his first line of defense. That was where he wanted to go. Uh, it took many, many years. The, the, the dam was not built the first stage of the dam, it's a three-stage dam, uh, did not happen for the next 10 years. Um, and part of it was because they were looking for the funding during that period. And if I'm looking at it, if I see this correct now, correctly now, there's the there's another part of this proposed 
called the Grand Inga Dam. That's correct. For uh, 2020, 2025 expected opening date that's supposed to be, will then be the largest energy generating body ever built. That is correct. Um, so, of course, my question is always, well, who benefits from that and, and you know, what's going to happen to the people themselves, uh, uh, the Congolese, that is, um, uh, and the communities there? How will they benefit or to what extent will they not benefit from, from what is generated uh, wealth-wise res- and, and, and uh, um, resource-wise from that dam? Uh, again, we're talking with Dr. Yvonne Sion here at I Mix What I Like, WPFW 89.3 FM. I'm Jared Ball. Dr. Haight is in here. Uh, um, helping not only having con- you know arranged this wonderful interview, but uh, of course conducting it. Mike Nacell is on the boards, making sure everything sounds as they're supposed to. We are again at I Mix What I Like, and all, for all your relevant social media, and I Mix What I Like at Gmail dot com, and I Mix What I Like dot org for more information on this show and more. So, yeah. Doctor Sion, do you have an idea about who? In the who, who new benefit? iteration, who benefits? Keep well, going on. Well, it's interesting that you ask that question. I think that's the sixty-four million dollar question. Or, like trillion, or billion trillion dollar, dollar right? <laughs> Sixty-four <laughs> reparations for there everything. You go. <laughs> goes to King Leopold. <laughs> well, one, one of the things right, um, yeah, I, right. I, um, I looked. I was checking some years after, about ten years ago, I guess I would say, and I, I was looking into this. And uh, one of the things that that struck me is that the people still don't have electricity in some parts of the Congo. Right, um, that's deep, right? Yeah, right. The other thing that struck me at that time was that uh, uh, when the discussions were going on about uh, the Grand Inga, Inga Dam uh, construction, um, I don't think there were any Congolese being in, involved in that. And, and that struck me. So, uh, you know, a lot of Europeans were uh in the conversation, some other Af- I don't think even many other African countries were involved, but um, that's that's the challenge. That's the kind of challenge that was going that's been going on forever. Uh, well, I mean, you mentioned and, you mentioned that you know they had to go to Belgium to get the paperwork. Well, yes, and of course, that, Belgium that, that is that a former because, colony colonizer. Of, well, of they had taken everything out of the offices, all the documents, all the papers, everything out of all the offices. As soon as Lumumba was brought into office, they as were like... As soon as independence came, they uh-huh. ran. They they left and they took everything. They to, looted the banks. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. They looted the, the documents, the folders, the papers. And so that was why we had to go to Belgium. And also a lot of the infrastructure, too, right? I mean, the, this was part of that whole we're leaving, we're taking even the light bulbs with us type thing, right? I mean, it was it's, it was a serious evacuation. It was yes, like it we, was. we're leaving and taking everything we think might help you. They destabilized technology that was left behind, destroyed, uh, you know, uh, transportation. They were making sure that when we leave, that we're going to leave it a, a crippled a, a, a nation as possible. Well, that, that was true in Guinea. It wasn't quite that bad in the Congo. Okay, okay. Uh, and I think because they were expecting the Congolese or the Belgians to be invited back, right? And, and okay, it, right, right. And right. to some extent, that was true. Uh, mm-hmm. Many of them uh, went and came back when things were calmer. Some of them never left. A and few. also to come back to get rid of Lumumba. I mean, that was part. Oh well, of... <laughs> getting getting rid of Lumumba. They they didn't have to go anywhere to do that. They okay. did that. They did that before I got. You know, okay. they had done that by the time I got there, and uh, in a very cruel way. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, but by that time, uh, the Armony had mutinied, uh, and uh, so it was not going to be easy for the Belgians to just get back in. The, the, one of the things that was a, a big point during that time was, uh, we're not going to have Belgian troops in here. And that was one of the reasons that uh, Katanga, one of the things that was behind the Katanga um, secession, they, the richest part of the Congo, Katanga and part of another province uh, were were uh, seceding because they were being encouraged by the Belgian government, uh, the Belgian government and the Belgian army, uh, and helped by the Belgian army. That was what ended Lumumba's life. Uh, and and let's make sure we underscore this point. Tell us why Lumumba was such a threat. I on, think on uh, a global scale for Africa, uh, for Africa's enemies. For one reason that he had achieved uh, independence under very difficult circumstances, number one, he wanted to help the people. He wrote a book called Congo, My Country. That's the English translation title. Uh, 
And uh, in in uh, in that book, he outlined his dream that uh, the government and the funds, the the resources of the country, would be used to benefit the people of the country. What was wrong with him? What was he thinking? <laughs> <laughs> Well, we're still trying to pursue that dream. Mm. Um, you ask who will benefit from the last stage of the Inga Dam. Um, I understand that uh, South Africa recently made a contract to use some of the energy being produced by the dam. So, Again, folks, that's Dr. Yvonne Sion. I'm Jared Ball, Dr. Haight, Mike Nacelle are all here. This is I Mix What I Like, WPFW 89.3 FM. Uh, having as good a time as I think we could imagine, have, you know, having this conversation with with yet another of our, uh, I think, uh, not often enough appreciated enough uh, scholars, educators, elders, uh, trying to expand some of these conversations and bring some 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 perspectives to 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 the airwaves that don't often get included from people who don't often enough get included in these conversations. So, and there was yeah. there was a, an event in D.C. recently. I didn't get the chance to make it, but I was listening to. Um uh, Voices with Vision with Netfa and company talking about the Tulema uprising in the Congo and the youth movements that are mm-hmm. taking place yeah. there now. Mm-hmm. Are you familiar with those as well? I've been hearing about them as well. Okay. Okay. I can't say that I'm familiar with them, but I, I okay. know that they've been occurring, and I've been uh, really excited to see that the, uh, uh, the Congolese people are beginning, and, and especially the youth, are beginning to uh, engage in a movement to make things right because. Uh, one of the things that, been, that has been happening, you go from one person who's looking for power to another person who's looking for power, and they feel that they have to get it by uh, collaborating with uh, the United States in particular and, uh, and uh, Belgium and other, uh, and other countries outside of the, Cong- uh, of the Congo and with people who are not Congolese people. So um, it's been exciting to see that happening, and I think that it's going to be the basis for resting uh, control of the Congo uh, away from uh, the neo-colonialist factions or forces. And then uh, again, Dr. Kito Swan was in contact with the uh, the Banya Malenge, who are a group of Tutsi uh, that are you know experiencing genocide. I think they they gave the numbers of about five point mil- five point four million people have been killed in the Congo and Rwanda. Um, of their group um, since the 1990s and that is um, like those numbers are horrific um, and people get it lost that the uh, genocide stopped at you know 1994 that this genocide actually is still continuing right right so um, and uh, the, the, the part of it that's in the Congo is the worst part and, and in, in addition to that the phenomenon of rape of, uh, of women uh, civilian women, and children, really young children as well, in eastern Congo is, is part of that story. Uh, the the last piece I want to mention on the Congo, um, well, obviously we could spend several shows talking about just the genocidal warfare against African people and the many different ways that it's taking place. Um, so we'll have you back on to discuss some of those things when we bring our, our sister Chioma Oru to talk about the uh, the rape and her work in the Congo. Um, and we were just gotten, get, given word that uh, for more information on that, people are invited to go to friendsofthecongo.org uh, for more on these issues and uh, what folks are trying to do to, oh, to absolutely. Uh, address them. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Big up to Moisa for that information. Yeah, absolutely. Thank the you. The African Film Fest is going on now until March 19th in the uh, AFI in Silver Spring. So check out there. Uh, check out um afi.com slash silver uh for more information there but of course you can go to um louisa mutali's um organization and check more information out there louisa give us some more information and we'll, and we'll tell everybody by the end of the show but um you also flew in, in lingala uh not fluent but i did learn to speak it while i was there that was the primary language uh uh, English and I'm sorry, French was the official language. Uh, English was not used at all, but I had to learn uh, uh, Lingala to talk with the people in my office and others. Mm, and okay, to, you know, to communicate outside of uh, of official speak. <laughs> you know, you gotta you gotta appreciate how serious the colonial uh, structures are when they're like you know, despite the fact that nobody in here 
speaks French. We're just going to make it the official language, and you'll learn it. And so that was going on. Yeah, absolutely. So your next um, piece, let's get to some of your work with UNESCO. Right, because we're still doing the bio. Seriously. <laughs> oh, <wow. Like> we're, <laughs> we're still working through the 60s here. So what's the next, after you left the Inga Dam project, what was the next project that you were working on? We have you um, also attending a UNESCO conference in Paris. Yes. Uh, when I left... When I came back home, um, things had been very challenging in the Congo. That, that there was a war going on, so to speak, and uh, a lot of tension. Uh, I had met a lot of people and knew a lot of people. I, I uh, functioned. I was able to function in my job very well. But uh, coming home, uh, I, but I was at the sense, at the stage where I said, "No, I, I cannot do this much longer." <laughs> uh, that there were t- there was a lot of what we call over against us in the spiritual world, uh, uh, with with all of the gold, uh, diamonds, coal tan, uh, etc. Uh, uh, there was just uh, too much opposition to Congolese governing themselves, uh, and too much warfare in terms of uh, the secession of the Congo and other people in the Congo that had wealth as well. Uh, when I say other people, other parts of the Congo where there was wealth besides Kinshasa, and there was still a lot of conflict going on. Uh, so I left in the 60s and uh, tried to find a job, and that was almost impossible coming home. Uh, it was very, very difficult. But I finally did uh, get work. Of, um, my family was very had friends in high places, and one of the people that... Uh, was a friend of mine was the Rep- Mr. Republican, the African American Republican, uh, Val Washington, and uh, Val made sure that I got introduced to uh, uh, the Minority Affairs Department of the State Department, and I did go to work at State, uh, working in the Office of International Conferences. That was my next uh, assignment, and it was through that assignment that I went to Paris. Um, the uh, the 14th General Assembly of UNESCO, because my job in, in the State Department was helping to put together the conferences, and uh, there were usually somebody from our office on the large conferences went along to uh, take care, of, make sure that the administrative affairs were taken care of. So I was assigned the first African American uh, woman, and the first woman, oh no, the second woman, first African American to lead, uh, to serve as uh, Secretary of Delegation to a United States delegation. And that was the 14th General Assembly of UNESCO, and it was in Paris, France. Lovely assignment to have. Uh, now, were you were you around with UNESCO when they were doing the peopling of, of ancient Africa, and that's the famous Joppo Benga conference where they smashed the Europhiles who try to say that Africa's ancient civilizations were actually... Uh, developed by white people. Uh, that is something that they would say, yes, but but no, I was not part of that. Uh, before, every every two years, the um, UNESCO had a general assembly, which was this kind of a grand meeting. Uh, it was usually held, it was always held in Paris. Um, and uh, I, we worked at that time, um, the, UNATO, the NATO staff was assist, would assist the embassy with... Um, Taking care of the Inga, I mean, of the uh, taking care of the uh, uh, UNESCO uh, conference. And this was a meeting of uh, people from around the world. I think we had about thirty-five people on our delegation, so it was a very large meeting uh, with with sessions all over Paris. Uh, we were there during the strike, and and one of the challenges for me as the secretary of delegation was to arrange for transportation for our delegates from one part of town to another um, during the uh, 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 metro rail strike. <laughs> and uh, if you can imagine, that was, as you might imagine, that was really something. The traffic was awful, but we did it. And let's get to the first African Festival of the Arts in Dakar, Senegal. Oh, I uh, in 66. Uh, I was still working at State when that occurred, and I was able to get leave so that I could spend, uh, I think it was two weeks in uh, Dakar, 
uh, for the first, for the first festival. That was a marvelous experience because there were artists and um, uh, all kinds of dance, theater, uh, music, everything from all over the African world, including uh, the United States, the West Indies, Europe, uh, and all the various African countries. Uh, that was a marvelous experience. It was the first time that such a gathering had, gathering had ever taken place, and I thoroughly enjoyed every moment of it. Uh, I, I saw M. A. Césaire, uh, the French uh, playwright, uh, produced uh, uh, King Christopher about Haiti, his play about Haiti, uh, at the festival. Uh, Haile Selassie was there to watch it, and he had some. African dancers there that same night. One of the things that shocked me, when the dancers came on, they were doing something that we did called the Boogaloo at the time, but that dance <laughs> turned out to be 3,000 years old. <laughs> Cultural memory, somebody once called it, I believe. Uh, Dr. Sion, did, were you saying that the State Department sponsored that festival? No, no. Oh, okay. You, just, wor- you were just I working, working there. Okay, there okay, the okay, okay, okay. That had happened. Mm-hmm. But this is under Senghor. It was under Senghor, uh, who I think um, he 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 was he had been a poet before he was president of his country, and he was always a patron of the arts. I later uh, spent some time in Senegal while he was still there, um, working on my doctorate degree in African and African American studies. Um, he was quite a patron of the arts, and he was also um, I think he may have been the longest well. He resigned after about 20 years, so he may be the first African president to resign and, and sponsor a um, peaceful turnover of government on the continent. Hmm. And now, while while you were there in Senegal, were you at all familiar with or meet with uh, the Omotal ancestor, Sheikh Ante Diop? I was familiar with Sheikh Ante Diop, and... Uh, he was not in town when I was there. He was not around when I was there. But I did go to visit uh, on another occasion. when I went back to Senegal in, uh, for, oh, I think it was the African Literature Association um, that was held. A meeting. One of their meetings was held. Uh, it's an American literary group uh, or group of scholars. And they, one of their meetings, their, their first meeting was held. that was held in Africa was in Senegal. And on that occasion, I was able to go to one of the museums that he had found and had some interesting experiences there. Um, I saw a, a mask that started talking to me, and I said, oh, my goodness, this must be a mask that's from my ancestral area. Uh, but it was a very, uh, I, guess, I guess I was spiritually possessed by the, the ancestral spirits that were in that mask. Uh, it was a very spiritual experience, and... Um, I was impressed, but when I went through that museum, I was really impressed by the work that Sheikh Abdul Jeff had done and was doing. You know, unfortunately, we're about out of time, so I'm going to ask to put you, well, I'm going to put you on the spot and ask that you commit on air to come back for part two pretty soon, because we have not even gotten out of the 60s in terms of your biography and clearly have so much more to, to get into with you. Um so I want, I'm just publicly inviting you on the air, on the spot to, 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 uh, work with us to, to commit at least another hour in this space, maybe somewhere else. We need to finish this conversation. Uh, and I'm certainly grateful for, to you for, uh, you know, having this much of it with us this morning. Well, I thank you for inviting me. I've enjoyed the experience and, uh, being able to share that, uh, as long ago as it was, but being able to share is, a, is an important part of it. Uh, and it's, I think it's part of why I'm here on this planet at this stage in my life. So uh, I'd be honored. Okay. Well, you all heard that here. You heard it here first, and that makes what I like. Dr. C, I'm going to be back for a part two before too long. Uh, hope, well, we'll see how soon. I, We're I make think, and and I soon. think there are several several <laughs> other parts that we got to get to because, you know, a lot of your experiences in the African world suggest that African people within the U.S., are connected with That's African right. people That's in the right. continent. That's right. Yeah. And recognize the importance of the liberation of Africa as a continent and liberation of African people, the resources, free to land, free to people. Um, so going out now, we got about a minute left. Where should we turn to 
um, for this next part so we can get a teaser for part two. Oh, you have the bio. <laughs> you tell me what's of interest. Well, I think I think your work in African American studies and your right. pioneering right. Your yes. directions in becoming one of the first doctorates in African American studies is is critical, <laughs> and then how you see that play out in life and your work. Right. Yeah, that's a very challenging and interesting question because uh, you talk about African Americans. We still don't know very much of our, of our history, and we still don't understand who we are as African people, and we're not always proud of who we are as mm. African people. We should be. Uh, I think all that has happened since Lumumba's death uh, helps to help to make that the reality that that we are uh, are still ashamed of ourselves because we hear nothing but war and and uh, decimation. But it's my my hope is that I will live to see the uh, the beginning of a change. And I think uh, when you talk about the movement in the Congo of the young students, um, that is a hopeful sign for me. Uh, and as I meet people uh, from the Congo uh, who happen to be coming here, and from all, all parts of Africa who are here, I have hope that things will change and that the people will one day benefit from all the riches and wealth. I think we can help by, uh, I've been uh, talking about um, coltan free, I mean conflict free coltan, which is the um, ingredient and all of our computer software and, and cell phones and, and all that. Yeah, yeah exactly. absolutely. Exactly. Well, Dr. Sion, thank you so much for giving us this part one. We're cl we are labeling clearly part one of an ongoing conversation we're going to have with you. Dr. Haight, thank you for arranging this. Dr. Swan, thank you for your background support on this as well. Dr. Burroughs, for your uh, continued uh, I Mix What I Like crew member work and service. Mike Nacella, thank you and I thank to all of you. Thanks to all of you for listening out there. This is I Mix What I Like, WPFW 89.3 FM. We'll catch you in the whirlwind. Peace if you're willing to fight for it, as Fred Hampton used to say. And thanks again to you, Dr. Sion. Take care of yourself.